My name is Dr. Jeffrey McCurry. You can call me Jeff. I'm the director of the Simon Silverman Phenomenology Center here at Duquesne University. It's my pleasure to welcome you here for the first annual Carl Stern Lecture. Um, about a year ago, we had a dedication of a, a small but very interesting uh, Carl Stern archive here at, here at Duquesne. And I think Dan's going to say a little bit about the man himself, um, Carl Stern, in a, in a few moments. Um, for me, it's just uh, my privilege to welcome you. It looks like we've got a small crowd, but uh, that just means more wine for all of us at the end. Um, and so um, I do want to say a few thank yous. Um, I first want to thank my staff, uh, uh, Mr. Johan Madaski, who is my graduate assistant. He's a PhD student um, in communication and rhetorical studies, writing on phenomenology and art. And then Ms. Angel Pryor, who's the Phenomenology Center librarian. And, uh, and everything we do here, they're very, very helpful. Um, I also want to thank the Dean's Office uh, and McAnulty College and Graduate School of Liberal Arts for co-sponsoring this lecture, as well as the Office of Mission and Identity, uh, Father Ray French, who unfortunately uh, sends his regrets and can't be here tonight, is the Vice President of Mission and Identity. I also wanted to just uh, briefly plug uh, our 34th Annual Phenomenology Symposium this coming March which is on a topic uh, not too far from the topic tonight. We're bringing in uh, Dr. Ian McGilchrist, who is a phenomenological psychiatrist um, from uh, uh, the UK, um, who's also very interested in uh, psychoanalysis, psychiatry, religion. Um, and so uh, this symposium will be on uh, contemplation, mindfulness, mysticism, and phenomenology and neuroscience. So uh, if you'd like more information, uh, we have some postcards uh, out on the desk. And uh, I'd love to talk to you more about that during the reception. Um, we're very happy you're here. Please let Johan, Angel, or myself know if there's anything we can do to make your night uh, more enjoyable. And now it's my pleasure to introduce Dean James Swindoll, uh, Dean of the McAnulty College and Graduate School of Liberal Arts. Thank you, Jeff. I wish we could have scheduled this lecture three weeks ago. We would have um, been able to anticipate some of the basic core uh, full premises that is by Dr. C. Uh, this is what Professor Carmel is going to do in a way. In a paper he wrote well before that, but we're hearing it for the first time today. For us, it would involve in a grasp of the unity of all natural creatures, which is ultimately metaphysical unity. The unity of composite things of which which do not perfect, possess perfection, even the higher forms of which, but which come to a greater perfection in union with each other's imperfection. The whole is greater than the sum of the parts. This is the core theme of the Pope's, and it sounds very much like what we'll hear today, uh, this evening as well. Um, there is a alumni, uh, number of alumni fairs going on today since it's homecoming weekend, of which I've been tied up, so unfortunately I will not be able to stay for the talk. Um, let me just say in the abstract, the number of times I've seen in one abstract the name St. Thomas Aquinas and Habermas is now a sum total of two. <laughs> <laughs> the other one was one that I did. <laughs> this, this is one of the most difficult lectures I've had to miss for. <laughs> But I'm everything sending, gets written I'm down. I'm sending you a copy. I'm sending you, everything gets written down. So, um, anyway, in Carl Stern's life, this co-naturality uh, is refracted in his life itself. Uh, he's a man whose own biography was filled with attempts at fuller perfection through conversion, through practicing himself a healing art and psychiatry, through his own life of study and letters. Integration and co-naturality was part of his life. And this is where I want to thank again Dan for really single-handed and uh, person for single-handedly bringing together a person that embodies uh, all of this kind of what I take to be a metaphysical reality, but certainly it's much more than that. And to bring him to Duquesne and to bring his 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 letters with him as well and his family last year, and now someone who knows very much the work. So it's a, it's a real embodiment of, of, of an intellectual life that I think is well suited for what we do at uh, Duquesne. So I'd like to again thank Jeff and Dan 
for, for bringing this together, and um, I'm very envious of you who will be here for this next hour. <laughs> so with that, um, I would like to introduce Dan to say a few words as well. Thank you. Thank you, Jim. Thank you, Jeff. On uh, September 24th, 2015, Pope Francis addressed the Joint Houses of Congress, and during his remarks, he dwelt reverentially on the lives of four remarkable Americans, Abraham Lincoln, Martin Luther King, Dorothy Day, and Thomas Merton. Of these four, not surprisingly, two are Catholic, uh, though we're apt to forget that neither Dorothy Day nor Thomas Merton was actually a cradle Catholic, on the contrary, they were converts, much like their beloved friend, Carl Stern, who after years of dithering on the doorstep of the church, finally converted to Catholicism after hearing Dorothy Day speak in Montreal in 1943. Now, like Pope Francis, I'm willing to wager that many of you still remember Day and Merton with respect and gratitude, as, as indeed you should, as indeed we should, but why don't we remember Stern? Well, even if he wanted to, I doubt that Pope Francis would have mentioned Stern on his historic address to Congress, because like our distinguished speaker today, Stern was not American, but Canadian. <laughs> Nevertheless, the affinities between Stern and Day and Merton run deep. Like them, Stern consciously and deliberately combined the activist and contemplative dimensions of Catholic spirituality in his daily life and work. Dorothy Day's causes, namely poverty, the rights of migrant workers and refugees, fighting racism and anti-Semitism, promoting peace and disarmament, defending the rights of workers to organize unions for collective bargaining, and so on. These were Stern's causes as well. And so, not surprisingly, Stern was a frequent contributor to and a generous supporter of Dorothy Day's newspaper, The Catholic Worker, which, believe it or not, still exists. And like Merton, the contemplative monk, Stern practiced prayer and meditation daily, or almost daily. Not an easy thing to do when you're a very popular professor and a chief of psychiatry at a large hospital in a, in a bustling metropolis like Montreal. Stern also embraced the spirit of openness, humility, and ecumenism <coughs> uh, that Francis praised so highly in Merton, promoting dialogue amongst people of diverse denominations, faiths, and philosophies. So, why don't we remember Stern? Well, I've just finished a long, longish book that delves into that very question. It's called Forgotten Freudian, The Passion of Carl Stern, and it will be appearing from Car uh, Carnac Press in December. For the past few years, as I struggled with successive drafts of this book, Don read and reflected on them, offering feedback and support at various points along the way. So before we begin today, I'd like to begin by thanking him for his patience and his generosity, and for making this first inaugural Carl Stern lecture all about Carl Stern, the man whom so many of us know so little about. Like that. <laughs> At the same time, I must confess that uh, the lecture series we're naming in his honor is not devoted solely to his work, uh, per se, uh, but to promoting thoughtful and creative interdisciplinary uh, research and writing on themes or in areas where psychology, theology, philosophy, and literature converge, uh, where they converge, overlap, and inform one another. And this is very much in, in the spirit of Stern. Uh, when he wanted to, uh, when he wanted to satisfy specific audiences or editors, Stern wrote sparkling standalone essays on theological, philosophical, or psychological topics where these modes of thinking and, and writing were not commingled but kept separate and pure. And, and they're excellent essays. But the integrative and interdisciplinary impulse ran deeper than his respect for the, the conventions of these disparate modes of inquiry. Nothing was more characteristic of Stern's writing than his ability to synthesize Christian humanism, existential phenomenology, psychoanalysis, and the love of literature in his fluent and masterful prose, such that all of his books have a deeply interdisciplinary perspective. So whether they address Stern's work specifically or not, all of our speakers in years to come will embody the same interdisciplinary attitude and sensibility. And it's now my great pleasure to introduce our speaker, Donald Carveff. <laughs> 
Professor Emeritus in Sociology and Social and Political Thought at York University, my alma mater. Don is a training and supervising analyst at the Canadian Institute of Psychoanalysis and a former director of the Toronto Psychoanalytic Institute. He's also the author of a wonderful book on the subject of conscience called The Still Small Voice, which I highly recommend. Don's talk will be followed by a commentary from John White, who taught philosophy at Franciscan University from 1997 to 2014. Uh, John is finishing a training analysis at the C.G. Jung Analytic Training Program here in Pittsburgh, and is currently the scholar in residence at the Science Silk and the Phenomenology Center right here. So I now give you Don Carbet. Uh, thank you, Dan, uh, for your kind introduction, and also thanks to Professor McCurry uh, of the Simon Silverman Phenomenology Center, and uh, also to Dean Jim Swindle, who I met earlier today, for facilitating uh, this invitation uh, to deliver this inaugural lecture of the Culture and Lecture Series here at Duquesne. It's an honor to be here. Dan was kind enough to uh, allow me to read through a pre-publication version of his forthcoming biography of Carl Stern. And it took me back some 30 years uh, to the time when I first read Stern's The Third Revolution. And this was a time when I personally was struggling to reconnect with my Anglo-Catholic roots, uh, which I had departed from at about age 15 uh, and was wanting to reconnect with, and uh, Dr. Stern's work proved to be of great assistance in that respect. So, colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, the Cartesian chasm, Carl Stern's understanding of the roots of our cultural pathology. As environmentalist Bill McKibben pointed out in a recent review, a uh, New York Review of Books a few weeks ago, uh, of the papal encyclical, quotes, instead of a narrow and focused contribution to the climate today, Laudato Si is, quote, no less than a sweeping, radical, and highly persuasive critique of how we inhabit this planet. An ecological critique, yes, but also a moral, social, economic, and spiritual commentary, unquote. According to His Holiness, Pope Francis, and I will quote extensively here, uh, for a minute from Laudato Si. Quotes, a certain way of understanding human life and activity has gone awry to the serious detriment of the world around us, unquote. The basic problem lies deeper than technology per se. Quotes, it is the way that humanity has taken up technology and its development according to an undifferentiated and one-dimensional paradigm. This paradigm exalts the concept of a subject who, using logical and rational procedures, progressively approaches and gains control over an external object. This subject makes every effort to establish the scientific and experimental method, which in itself is already a, te a technique of possession, mastery, and transformation. It is as if the subject were to find itself in the presence of something formless, completely open to manipulation. Men and women have constantly intervened in nature, but for a long time, this meant being in tune with and respecting the possibilities offered by the things themselves. It was a matter of receiving what nature itself allowed, as if from its own hand. Now, by contrast, we are the ones to lay our hands on things, attempting to extract everything possible from them, while frequently ignoring or forgetting the reality in front of us. Human beings and material objects no longer extend a friendly hand to one another. The relationship has become confrontational." Unquote. In Francis's view, and I quote again for the last time, many problems of today's world stem from the tendency, at times unconscious, to make the method and aims of science and technology an epistemological paradigm which shapes the lives of individuals and the workings of society. 
The effects of imposing this model on reality as a whole, human and social, are seen in the deterioration of the environment. But this is just one sign of a reductionism which affects every aspect of human and social life." Unquote. So in finding the roots of the ecological crisis in an objectifying epistemological paradigm, Francis is in fundamental agreement with the thought of Carl Stern, who over a half a century ago arrived at the same diagnosis. Locating the origins of the malaise of modernity in what he saw as the ever-widening Cartesian chasm, those are Stern's words, between res cogitans and res extensa, subject and object, reason and nature. Like Francis, Stern in no way devalues science and technology per se. Quotes, if one regards the split, this is a quote from Stern, if one regards the split as the basic premise for all scientific investigation, it is quite legitimate. It was only by this radical severance between an observing subject and observable object that the exact sciences could be developed." Unquote. But when, quote, methods become mentalities, Stern's phrase, when methods become mentalities, when a heuristic division is reified, and extended beyond its proper domain, what results is a, quote, disastrous fallacy, leading to a, quote, fearful estrangement, in which subjects, reduced to their cognitive functions, confront and seek to observe, manipulate, and control phenomena, reduced to the status of material and biological objects. Stern writes, quote, a theory to remain strictly scientific, has to treat the world around us as some huge, monstrous rays extensa that I can analyze experimentally and mathematically, but into which I cannot enter intuitively. If I insist on treating the universe around me as such a scientific object, I have to assume a strange attitude. I have to cease to belong to the universe I am studying." Unquote. Distinct from such objectifying knowledge, Jacques Maritain, following St. Thomas and Dionysus the Areopagite, recognized knowledge through co-naturality, through Einfühlung, empathy, we can identify with people and animals on the basis of our common creatureliness. And even, we can even identify with all material objects, for like them, we are. This type of identification, or imaginative union, is capable of yielding a sense that in Sturm's words, quotes, this is the universe to which I belong. In the Third Revolution, Stern made the case that psychoanalysis, despite its manifest materialism, and biological reductionism represents a profound challenge to both subject-object and mind-body dualism and the deepening sense of estrangement to which they give rise by objectifying the other and reducing the subject to a disembodied and disaffected observer. So despite surface appearances, his whole argument is that psychoanalysis is been misunderstood, not least by the Catholic Church, but only because it has misunderstood itself. Uh, I'll elaborate on that in a minute. In an essay on psycho entitled Psychoanalysis and Philosophy, Stern writes that it was the psychiatrist and philosopher Karl Jaspers who was the first to point out that quotes the discovery, psychoanalysis, was not made by scientific methods if by science we mean the experimental and the quantifiable, it was made by a stroke of empathic genius and only dressed up in the semantics of the experimental quantifiable sciences. Sigmund Freud uh, came of age in the era of ideological Darwinism. He was born only three years prior to the publication in 1859 of The Origin of Species. <clears throat> 
His subsequent training in the 19th century Helmholtz School of Physicalistic Physiology, he spent many years carrying buckets of eels around Vienna because he was dissecting them to study the nervous system of, of eels. Uh, and he wanted to be a professor of physiology. He didn't want to be a physician. He, did, he didn't have much of a desire to cure people. He wanted to know. Uh, in any case, his teachers trained him. They were passionate Darwinians, and they trained him in this reductionist physiology. And this meant that his conception of science was thoroughly positivist and reductionist. He was later to complain that his scientific reports of his work with patients read like short stories, which really troubled him. Uh, he felt compelled to supplement his humanistic clinical theory, which like both great and not so great literature is about people, their motives, their conflicts, and their suffering, with an abstract second level of theory, the so-called metapsychology, developed in the depersonalized, materialistic and bio biologistic language of forces, energies, instincts, and mechanisms, grounded in a conception of the human mind as something like a machine, a steam engine perhaps, and a reductionist concept of man as an animal. Now while certainly recognizing our animality, even such later Darwinists as Sir Julian Huxley transcended the reductionism of Darwin's champion, Julian's grandfather, Thomas Henry Huxley, by recognizing, quotes, the uniqueness of man, as a title of a great essay by Julian Huxley, The Uniqueness of Man. Whenever I use that phrase, uniqueness of man, in order to defend against the assumption that I'm embracing some form of inglorious speciesism, I, can't, I can barely get the phrase out in my classes at the university without a bunch of undergraduates saying, you're making man superior to animal. <laughs> in order to defend against the assumption I'm embracing some sort of inglorious speciesism, I'm compelled to point out that critics of humanity's unique destructiveness are like Sir Julian acknowledging our uniqueness freed as we are from the instinctual restraints built into other species. Stern writes, quotes, Freud deceived himself into thinking that he created something resembling the natural sciences, while all his genuine discoveries were based on empathy, unquote. In its abstract metapsychology, psychoanalysis displays what Jürgen Habermas refers to as its, quote, scientistic self-misunderstanding. In reality, psychoanalysis is a verstehende discipline, employing what the psychoanalyst Heinz Kohut called the empathic introspective method, yielding knowledge less by observation than by co-naturality. Stern explains how psychoanalysis undermines the dualism of mind versus body through its insights into the unconscious dynamics underlying psychosomatic illness, mind and body being revealed by psychoanalytic studies of psychosomatic illness as far more intimately interconnected than any Cartesian dualism would allow. In this connection, I recall the man who many years ago came to me covered in an inflamed and oozing rash that a multiplicity of medical and alternative therapies had failed to heal. It quickly began to disappear as through psychoanalysis he became aware of how his hitherto unconscious hatred of his parents and his siblings made him feel condemned to burn in hell, his burning rash. He'd been raised in a particularly concrete form of Greek Orthodox Christianity on one of the Greek islands where they believe in the magic, the, 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 what's the eye, the, uh, evil eye. the evil eye, and so on and so forth. And, you know, his, he was the eldest son, and he couldn't get his business in Toronto off the ground because he was always having to fly to Athens uh, to get his parents, his aging parents, out of some jam, one after another, the father, deeply narcissistic and cruel man, the mother, chronically depressed, 
he moved them to Montreal, but now he was on, always on the train from Toronto to Montreal getting them out of the latest jam. And so I asked, you know, where are your siblings? Oh, well, this brother is leading a fashionable life in Athens, and that sister is leading a fashionable life in Paris, and so on and so forth. So I asked, well, I mean, does it ever bother you that you're sort of saddled with... He said, what, you, you think I should be angry? I said, my friends sometimes ask if I'm angry. The next session he came and he was starting to get angry. And the rash was starting to diminish. Session after that he was quite angry and the rash was 50% gone. Third session, he was beginning to demand that the siblings take their role in looking after the parents, and he was starting to, to put up some boundaries with the parents, and the rash was disappearing. I won't go on with the case, because he, he then proceeds to get into little car accidents, and he proceeds to get involved with a, with a cruel woman who torments him, so his need for punishment wasn't cured. The rash <laughs> I'd be happy to say I cured him. <laughs> the rash went, but uh, he found other persecutors. Um, okay, in, so the point is the mind-body connection. In, in eroding defenses against feelings, defenses against feelings that are employed not just by schizoid intellectuals, we all know about that, we have at a university, uh, but it's not just schizoid intellectuals, who have defenses against feelings. Uh, lots of business guys and accountants and have defenses against feelings. Um, in eroding such defenses on the part of anyone who attempts to live primarily in their head, psychoanalysis promotes the development of emotional, in addition to cognitive intelligence. Beyond this, the empathic method of psychoanalysis overcomes the strict division between subject and object through an imaginative union whereby the self puts itself in the place of the other and the other in the place of the self. Freud, Melanie Klein, Wilfred Dion describe processes of projection and introjection whereby I unconsciously attribute elements of myself to another and elements of another to myself. Sometimes the other induces his or her feelings in me. So I'm carrying their feelings, that they've evacuated somehow, and now those feelings are in me. And sometimes I induce my unbearable feelings in him or her. Sometimes we even come unconsciously to enact induced traits and play a part in another's drama, or get them to play a part in ours. Such unconscious processes expose the often blurry distinction between inner and outer, self and other. Over the years in my work with couples, I've usually found that a good deal of what he complains of in her is rather similar to what she complains about in him and what I end up complaining to myself about both of them. <laughs> Not that such insight is entirely new. Long ago, the greatest therapist of all time asked, quotes, And why beholdest thou the mote that is in thy brother's eye, but considerest not the beam that is in thine own eye? Matthew 7, 3, KJ. <coughs> Stern provides clinical illustrations of how insight into a patient's unconscious subjectivity facilitates treating him or her as a thou, rather than as an it, to use Martin Luther's categories, a humane alternative to the objectifying treatments so often provided by non-analytic psychiatry. I mean, Stern was upset that psychoanalysis, because of Freud's atheism and materialism, had a bad name, especially in Catholic communities, where, in fact, um, Catholic psychiatrists were, 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 were being looked upon more favorably than psychoanalysts, and yet those Catholic psychiatrists might, through their very socialization in psychiatry, might be uh, applying methods to their patients which are quite dehumanizing, as opposed to psychoanalytic treatment, which could be quite humanizing. He was really trying to help people understand this. Okay, for Stern, 
At the outset, at least, Cartesianism is not alienation pure and simple. The very structure of the res extensa, manifesting order rather than chaos, is the foundation of Descartes' idea of a mathesis universalis, a hypothetical universal science modeled on mathematics that would reveal the lawful structure of reality. Although Descartes was a contemporary of Bishop Jacensius and may have had some contact with him, Descartes' cleavage between spirit and nature had not yet devolved into the Manichaean hatred of the creation and the flesh, characteristic of Jansenism and Calvinism. Blaise Pascal, also a contemporary of Jansensius, uh, influenced by Port Royal, manifests more than a hint of this Manichaeanism, the, the famous phrase, the silence of these infinite spaces terrifies me. But such Manichaeanism, uh, Manichaeism emerges in Plena Vitiatum Extreme, in Schopenhauer and Sartre. By the time we get to Schopenhauer, Stern writes, quotes, instead of logos versus materia, it's more a question of logos versus bios. And while for the Frenchman, the rays extensa, the universe around us, could be elucidated as a crystalline pattern, at least Descartes' vision was a vision of order. Um, to the Teutonic mind, Schopenhauer's, it became a huge, dark vortex of insatiable forces. And quote, sex is the evil lying at the very center of nature." Finally, in the thinking of another Frenchman, Jean-Paul Sartre, a philosopher not at all averse to sex, the more perverse the better, as revealed in Hazel Rowley's uh, biography of de Beauvoir and Sartre. Um, the by the time we get to start, the split between res cogitans and res extensa has deepened into that between etre pour soi and etre en soi, the estranged, one could well say, schizoid subject, forever confronted with a persecutory world of sheer contingency, in which, in Stern's words, quotes, you are inextricably, he's describing Sartre, you are inextricably involved with matter, mother, and moreover, it is for Sartre a sticky, messy, oozing business which makes you vomit." Unquote. So we start with Ray's extensa, which is at least a world of mathematical order, and then we get to a world which is a dark vortex of insatiable forces, and sex is the evil, and then we come to uh, is to ooze. Thank you. <laughs> From a psychoanalytic point of view, um, I find quite convincing Stern's tracing of the pathological forms of dualism, characteristic of these thinkers, to disturbances in their early relationships with their mother. Uh, in his book, Flight for a Moment, he does a whole series of, of, um, of applied psychoanalytic studies of philosophers. And, and, um, and he does not do so reductionistically. I mean, he has a critique of reductionism. And, and uh, I think he, he studies um, are, are, are acute, but um, fairly non-reductionist. Anyway, he traces their dualism to disturbances in their early relationships with the mother. So the hatred of matter, Manichaean hatred of matter, is for Stern ultimately the hatred of mater. Descartes' mother died when he was just over a year old. Schopenhauer seems to have been a cold, castrating narcissist. Sartre, who lost his father at age two, was raised by his mother in her father's home. He seems to have regarded her more as a sister than a mother, and he unapologetically acknowledges his fondness for relationships tinged with an incestuous frisson. In the Sartrean vision, given the battle to the death of consciousnesses, in which, quotes, hell is other people, and, quotes, man is a useless passion, loving mutuality appears all but impossible. And he kept saying, I'm describing relations in bad faith, and one day I'll write about 
I'll write about relations in good faith, but that book never really appeared, although uh, Simone de Beauvoir made an effort in that direction in, in her book, The Ethics of Ambiguity. Um, but Stern argues that psychoanalysis lifts the curse of a Manichaean fission by exposing the inner bond between instinctual drives and the loftiest strivings of man, between the connection between the undifferentiated need for love in the newborn and the gift of love by the mature. Psychoanalysis reveals that phonic forces may over time be tamed and transformed through the processes of substitution that Hegel described as aufheben or sublation, and that Freud called sublimation. Later, psychoanalysts such as Melanie Klein and Donald Winnicott described the developmental progression from narcissistic self-encapsulation to the capacity for concern for the other and from envy to gratitude. This whole idea of substitution and, and, and uh, sublimation by my mentor, the recently deceased Eli Sagan, um, was quite convinced that um, both on the level of the individual or on the level of the collective, we can't get people to give something up unless we can give them something to substitute for what they've given up. So he talks, his first book was about cannibalism, and he talks about how we gave up cannibalism, eating our enemies, when we moved, when we advanced to simply taking their heads and decorating our hut with their heads. So we moved from oral devouring to anal collecting. And then the next move was when we gave up taking heads and we simply moved into human sacrifice, throwing people into the volcano. And then the next advance was when we got the bright idea of just not killing our enemies at all, but putting them to work, slavery. And then we strive to give up slavery. Well, we haven't quite succeeded in that one yet. We've made some fairly, fairly profound leaps, but there's still slavery in this world. Um, and uh, for, 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 for Sagan, our, our move in this direction, sublimation, stalled, along with uh, Lyndon Baines Johnson's War on Poverty and his program for the Good Society. And since then, we've been stalled and suffering severe backlash. Um, Sagan's latest work is about what he called modernity psychosis, the psychotic forms in which this backlash uh, against the sublimatory move towards greater equality and democracy. Um, okay, so Stern is saying that through sublimation, psychoanalysis reveals how primitive forces can be transformed. Um, in Western culture, the valorization of scientific or analytic objective over Verstehen, aesthetic and intuitive ways of knowing, became extreme. Stern writes, quotes, the reason most of us hesitate to apply the word, the word knowledge to insight within the aesthetic continuum and want to reserve it strictly for scientific knowledge is that our minds have become so warped by the positivist bias that we cannot even think straight anymore, unquote. But to hold that a disturbed early relationship with the mother may predispose one to feel a pervasive alienation from feelings and from being, to privilege intellect over emotion, and prefer technical mastery over rather than a grateful, mutually sustaining relationship with nature, is not at all to equate, as Stern does, the objective analytic dominating an activist orientation with masculinity, and the empathic intuitive, receptive, and contemplative virtues with femininity. He was writing half a century or more ago. Patriarchy was much more thoroughly ensconced, and these patriarchal equations were common uh, at that time. So we're looking at Stern from the benefit of hindsight now. Uh, the mere fact that these equations long characterized our patriarchal culture is no valid reason for retaining them. In keeping, however, with these outmoded associations, Stern, like Freud, considers the aggressive 
tyrannical, castrating type of woman that he associates with Hedda and her companions. Chapter 8, In Flight from Woman, Hedda Gobble and her companions. He, 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 like Freud, considers such women masculine, precisely because he idealizes women. Uh, in reality, both men and women can sometimes be cold and destructive, and sometimes warm and nurturing. In his book by that title, Stern is not really writing about flight from woman, but about flight from the nurturing qualities, the wisdom, and virtues traditionally associated with women, but that are desperately needed by both sexes. Stern opens flight from woman with a discussion of the problem of activism, Quotes, a lack of balance between action and contemplation is said to be characteristic of our time. The man of restless energy, the hustler and go-getter, is a figure familiar to the popular imagination. One associates this kind of life with organization men, managerial and executive types, unquote. While Stern sees the hyper-rationalism and hyper-activism of our culture as reflecting, quote, a maternal conflict, and a rejection of the feminine, five decades later, in a world in which hyperactive and hyperrational female executives are not rare, we can see that the problem reflects not a rejection of the feminine, but of values such as receptivity, tenderness, nurturance, patience, feelings, the heart, traditionally associated with femininity. In his critique of our frenzied activism, restlessness, endless drive and ambition, flight into work, denial of feelings, shying away from tenderness and a fear of dependence and passivity, unquote, Stern echoes the earlier work of the Scottish psychotherapist Ian Sutton, who wrote of the taboo on tenderness, characteristic of our culture. That book by Sutton, uh, The Origins of Love and Hate, written in 1935, is quite a remarkable book, really. In his essay on Joseph Piper, Stern writes, like Faust, Western man since the Renaissance has been on a continuous, never-ending quest for domination, conquest, and domination. Nature and the universe have become an object of prying into and technical mastery. In rural civilization, rural civilizations, man's attitude toward nature contained a necessary element of patience and abandonment, an attitude of waiting for things to grow, and trust that the cycles of nature would fulfill themselves. Future is all that which I let come toward me in an attitude of patience, passivity, suffering. In contrast to this, to the activist temper of our time, future is that which I am going to shape and to master." Unquote. In relation to the sociologist and psychoanalyst Eric Fromm's distinction between rational faith and irrational faith, Stern writes that the former, rational faith, is for Fromm, quote, linked with the experience of growth. It implies an active relation with man and nature and is therefore linked with activity and is typical of a tendency to establish the activist and rationalist mood of our time as the foundation of the human condition and to make religious terms hallowed by age fit this current philosophy. That's Stern writing about Fromm. <clears throat> and here, I believe, Stern puts his finger on a major flaw in the thought of an otherwise admirable thinker. In, in my review of a recent book that forms part of the current and long overdue Fromm revival, I pointed out that for Fromm, passivity is almost a dirty word. Following Karl Marx, Fromm located human nature, our species being, in productive activity. But it is unrestrained Promethean activity, industry, and growth in both capitalist and socialist forms that has and is destroying our ecosystems, and hence ourselves. Fromm defined what he saw as the mature and healthy approach to life as a productive orientation. This stress upon productivity, activity, powers, and achievement exists, to my mind, in tension 
uh, with Fromm's late groping towards the values of being. It is true that in his later years, Fromm became interested in Buddhism, especially Zen, and began, as Gabriel Marcel had done earlier, uh, to distinguish being from having, but notably not from doing. <clears throat> Given the centrality of productive activity in Fromm's very definition of human nature and his devaluation of passivity, I was not surprised to learn from Lawrence Friedman's recent biography of Fromm's hyperactive personal style. Hence Friedman's title, not the life of Eric Fromm, but the lives, plural, <laughs> of Eric Fromm. Or, I wasn't surprised to learn of the sequence of heart attacks that finally killed him. In my view, a critique of humanism for what appears to be its intrinsic anthropocentrism, I have trouble with the term Christian humanism, because I wonder, how can you be humanist if by definition, if, by, if, if your definition is of humanism is anthropocentrism, man is the center of all things, and is, can there be a, a non-anthropocentric humanism? And how then can there be a Christian humanism? Is there a Christian anthropocentrism? That's impossible. Christianity is supposed to be God-centered, not man-centered, so I don't know how you can have a Christian humanism. It depends on how you define these words, of course. But, um, uh, in my view, a critique of humanism for what appears to be its intrinsic anthropocentrism, man, after all, being the measure of all things in its view, need not amount to an anti-humanism, only perhaps to a chastened post-humanism. Fromm was a very caring man. I wish he'd seen his way clear to defining maturity and health as a caring rather than a productive orientation to life. Despite uh, his famous disparagement of the Christian love command, Freud, Sigmund Freud, in contradiction with his famous attack in Civilization and its Discontent on the Christian love command, I mean, you know, he says, why would I, I only have so much love, why would I give it to my enemies? Why would I give it to my neighbors? I only have so much, I should give it to my own people. I, I, I'm, be, I'm betraying my, my, my own people if I give my love to just any Tom, Dick, and Harry. Uh, um, and Freud says it's irrational to love one's enemies. He, he would much more understood if the phrase was uh, 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 the, that I should love others as they love me. That would make sense for it, thanks. <laughs> but, uh, so he's disparaging the Christian love command, um, which strikes him as just sheer irrationality. Nevertheless, he viewed personal development as a progression from narcissism to object love, holding that, quotes, in the last resort, we must begin, this is 1914, in the last resort, well, the, crit the critique of the love command came in 1930. Uh, Freud changed. The young Freud was a very different character than the late Freud. The late Freud became bitter, reactionary, conservative. So, anyway, it was in 1914, he writes, in the last resort, we must begin to love in order not to fall ill. And we are bound to fall ill if in consequence of frustration, we are unable to love, unquote. There, Freud is giving voice to the Judeo-Christian morality, which underlies his work, despite his efforts to hide this fact. Likewise, Carl Stern conceived maturation as proceeding from lower to higher levels of union, from infantile oneness with mother to ideally a fully mature capacity for self-dispossessing love of the other. Quotes, we have at the beginning of the scale, he writes, a being who is all mouth, an undifferentiated libidinal gastrula, highly vulnerable to any deprivation of love. And at the end of the scale, a mature being capable of giving love without immediate return and capable of enduring rejection." Unquote. Nowadays, of course, we understand the newborn as far more than an undifferentiated libidinal gastrula, but Stern's vision of maturity and health as entailing a progression from an almost total need for love to the developed capacity to give it even with little prospect of a return, 
might well be widely accepted today, except by those who, like Freud himself, conceive of love in essentially capitalistic terms, viewing an investment with little prospect of a return as irrational and masochistic. But I think Freud was divided on this. Personal growth, Stern emphasizes, quotes, is not merely an unconscious unfolding like organic growth. Here, in human development, freedom and choice, failure and guilt are mysteriously added, unquote. Unlike Freud, who for the most part saw only one kind of guilt with which he associated the superego, namely aggression turned away from others and back against the self. That's the essence of the superego. The aggression is turned away from the rival siblings and parent back, and so I'm now beating on myself as I would like to have beat on my rivals. Ergo, the superego. Aggression turned on the self. Um, that's the, the guilt that Freud understood. Like Melanie Klein, Stern recognized two fundamentally distinct types of guilt. A guilt that cannot be appeased, that is accompanied by anxiety, and that often arises in response not just to deeds, but even to wishes, an abnormal guilt inflicted by the superego. And a normal guilt that when there is true contrition can be appeased, a guilt that we can let go of and relegate to the past in the face of an honest resolution to do better. Both Klein and Stern recognize these two kinds of guilt. Um, while psychoanalysts have traditionally associated the former with an archaic superego and the latter with a mature superego, I have recently made a case in my book in 2013 for confining superego to the persecutory guilt that is aggression turned against the self, reserving the term conscience for the reparative guilt mediated by love that constructively seeks the healing of both the other and the self. Okay, just to get the two down, and it's Melanie Klein and Leon Grinberg that are most clear on this. If, if I've injured someone and he's bleeding in the corner, and I'm flagellating myself, that's persecutory guilt. Doesn't do much for him. If I put down the cat of nine tails, get out the first aid kit, and go and start attending to his wounds, that's reparative guilt. And what I'm doing, what I argued was that we should confine the term superego for that agency that generates the persecutory guilt, and we should reserve the term conscience for the agency that generates reparative guilt. Unfortunately, Freud, in 1923, merged conscience into superego, and he lost the distinction. He deprived us of the distinction, and clinically, he made it hard for us to study conflicts between conscience and superego, because they often conflict. Uh, and they each conflict also with ego and superego. I mean, psychoanalysis is supposed to be the science of inner conflict, but here's a whole domain of inner conflict between conscience and superego that Freud's decision to merge them made it difficult for us to, to study. Um, okay, in its preoccupation with the persecutory guilt generated by the superego, the law of the father, that according to Freud forms near the end of the Oedipal phase at around five or six years of age, psychoanalysis has been relatively blind to the roots of conscience in the early mother-infant relationship, in identification with the nurturer, this is where Eli Sagan and I and Melanie Klein uh, find the roots of conscience in the early identification with the nurturer. Um, and Freud was relatively blind to this, not least because of his patriarchal devaluation of women in general and minimization of the importance of the so-called pre-edible phase of mother-child symbiosis before the Almighty Father appears on the psychic scene. Notice he calls it the pre oedipal phase. It's like foreplay before the main event, which is the Oedipus complex when father appears on the scene. The rest is just foreplay, mother and He says the women analysts will tell us about this. He says, I feel really uncomfortable when patients try to turn me into a breast or, or, or a womb. 
uh, but the women analysts will be able to deal with those transferences. And that's how we learn about the mind in psychoanalysis, is through transference. But I can't stand being made into a mother. Uh, uh, Freud, you mean? Freud. Oh. Freud couldn't stand it. Personally, I don't mind. <laughs> I, 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 I just want to. Uh, I don't <laughs> problem. <laughs> um, okay, so. I'm trying to make this distinction that we should separate out conscience and superego. So far, I regret to report that my colleagues have not been overwhelmed by my proposal of a new psychoanalytic testament uh, that posits conscience as a fourth element of the structural theory of the mind. Going to the New York psychoanalytic, as we did a year ago, to argue that conscience needs to be added to id, ego, and superego as a fourth structure is, I think, a bit like going to Rome to argue that, wonderful as it is, the Trinity needs to be expanded into a quaternity. <laughs> it didn't go over very well in New York. <clears throat> but I had grounds for believing that Carl Stern would have sympathized with my project. He wrote that, quotes, currents emanating from the primitive superego have much in common with our instinctual drives, unquote that obsessions, compulsions, scrupulosity, etc., which all have the earmarks of blind force and of cruelty, unquote. He refers approvingly to the diagram provided by psychoanalyst Henri E., in which, quotes, the superego and the id are on the same level. He even goes so far as to state music to my ears that, quotes, all this points in favor of those who draw a clear line between conscience on the one hand and the primitive superego on the other, unquote. So I think I'm supported by Stern a little bit in, in this. On the other hand, in writing that, quotes, conscience has all the characteristics of human reason. This is Stern in, in, uh, this is Stern in 1955, uh, page 174. Uh, uh, so it's 10 years before the last. 10 year. years before the last. In, in writing that, conscience has all the characteristics of human reason, he writes. In saying that, he joins those psychoanalytic colleagues, such as Franz Alexander, 1925, Shandor Ferenczi, 1928, and Freud himself, 1940. Those analysts who call for the disempowerment of the hostile superego in favor of the rational ego. Freud himself calls for the demolition of the superego. Ferenczi says that a complete analytic cure requires the complete demolishment of the superego. People thought, what? That's going to create psychopaths. No, says Freud, says Ferenczi, says Alexander, because the ego will be the center of values, will be the center of conscience. Because they argue that real ethical thought involves thinking, <coughs> involves thinking about consequences and of what's going to be best for me and others. Uh, okay, uh, here I part company with Stern, Freud, Abraham, all of these guys because uh, uh, I just don't believe that the superego can be replaced by the rational ego. As if rationality, Pace St. Thomas Aquinas, now I'm not a Thomas scholar, so I'm willing to be corrected about this, but I get the impression that St. Thomas has great confidence in reason and rationality insofar as moral and ethical thinking is concerned, and I don't share that confidence at all, because, uh, so I write here, as if rationality could ever serve as a conscience and tell us right from wrong. Although it is, of course, possible to question such philosophical axioms, I, for one, remain convinced that one cannot deduce an ought from an is, and that science is descriptive, not prescriptive, its competence being limited to the field of facts, not of values. <clears throat> it's true that knowing that smoking can cause cancer is relevant to the decision whether or not to smoke. But science cannot determine that health is better than illness, nor life worth living. Those are value choices, beyond reason, grounded in love or the lack thereof. 
Stern is closer to the truth when he writes that, quote, conscience contains something which transcends our psychological data, unquote. That something being, in my view, the heart that, as Blaise Pascal famously pointed out, has reasons reason cannot know, and that generates in us, as Jean-Jacques Rousseau understood, the pity or fellow feeling in which values and acts of conscience are grounded. So, like Freud, I want to get rid of the superego, but I don't have this confidence it can be replaced by the rational ego. Therefore, I want it to be replaced by conscience, which is grounded in the early relationship with the nurturing primary caretaker, still most usually the mother, um, from which we acquire uh, the basic moral principle. Freud was alert to the principle of human reciprocity, the principle of reciprocity at work in the psyche, but only in its negative form. He called it tally on law. Eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth. If I receive hate from you, I will give hate back. But he was blind to the fact that there is an accompanying principle of moral reciprocity. For love received, I need to give love back. And so the early films by Renee Spitz show the mother and the baby and her breast is in his mouth, but he's got his fingers in her mouth. And then she's spooning food into his mouth. And, and when he's a little older, he's taking a spoon and he's spooning food into her mouth. Uh, so in Bach's uh, 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 Christmas oratorio, uh, I come here and give to thee that which thou hast given me. There is the principle of reciprocity. And that's the ground of conscience, in my opinion. Now, of course, there are many other layers of conscience that grow on top of that, but that's the primitive unlock, the base of conscience, as far as I can see it. Emancipation from the hostile superego, which I think is the central task of psychotherapy. Emancipation from the hostile superego requires reconciling with conscience. But in order to face, work through, I think there's a zero-sum relationship between superego and conscience. I think that when you're out of sync with your conscience, your superego, I think the superego is like the Gestapo. Uh, the superego is going to punish you. And there's only one way to disarm this inner sadist, and that is to surrender to conscience. There's no other way. Sooner or later, the superego will persecute you, unless you reconcile with conscience. Um, but in order to, to face, work through, and make reparation for the guilt for which we are responsible, we must first emancipate ourselves from the guilt and shame for which we are not responsible. Now, this is a new insight for me. I, I gave an earlier talk to a group of Catholic social workers just a few months ago. And uh, many of the black women social workers were working with women who were being battered by men. And they very kindly objected to the focus of my talk, um, because I was talking about this need to escape superego persecution by reconciling with conscience, by taking responsibility for one's sins. Um, and so I learned something important from these women. In order to face work through and make a reparation for the guilt for which we are responsible, we must first emancipate ourselves from the guilt and shame for which we are not responsible, Guilt and feelings of inferiority that were projected by and incorporated from those unwilling to carry them themselves and who did their best to induce them in a scapegoat. Think only of the children who blame themselves instead of their deficient or abusive caretakers. Or the generations of those we treated and induced to think of themselves as subhuman. As James Baldwin, 1969, famously put it, whom we induce to think of themselves as mules when they never really were mules, and we knew it. In order to facilitate recovery from such moral poisoning, it's crucial that as therapists we establish a non-judgmental atmosphere. As Stern pointed out, this constitutes, quotes, one of the oldest traditions in medicine, even outside psychiatry and even before Christianity, in ancient Chinese and Greek medicine, 
one of the natural rights of the patient was not to be morally judged by the physician, unquote. Beyond such medical and professional requirements, a range of religious traditions provide different versions of the command to judge not. Experienced therapists know that if the patient encounters moral judgment on the part of the therapist, the therapy will fail. Either because the outraged client will leave, or because he or she will derive masochistic gratification in submitting to judgment and punishment by an external superego in the form of the therapist. Therapy becomes a spanking. But does establishing such a non-judgmental atmosphere mean one necessarily becomes blind, deaf, and dumb when it comes to moral issues? That like the three wise monkeys, one sees no evil, hears no evil, and speaks no evil. Does good therapeutic technique involve turning a blind eye to the ethical dimensions of the patient's behavior and problems? Stern has been very helpful here. Stern, 1975, has argued the most effective therapeutic situation is one where patients have, quote, a complete sense of non-condemnation by therapists who have, quote, something in their personalities that gives the patient a sense of the primacy of charity and acceptance, who do not preach, but who at the same time convey to their patients, quote, an awareness that the therapist believes in moral values, unquote. Here is where I think the distinction between superego and conscience becomes crucially important. Patients have a right to expect acceptance and exemption from superego judgment by their therapist, but whether they know it consciously or not, they need the therapist to have a conscience and to be able to hear its still small voice, for the entire therapy depends upon their getting our help to be able to hear it themselves. For this is the only avenue of escape from the persecutory superego. Since the conscience is devoted to truth, love, and justice, it will naturally assist us in sorting out what we're authentically responsible for, and what we are not. Carl Stern is being too generous. Um, he's being too generous to Freud and giving insufficient credit to his own powers of discernment when he writes, quotes, the Freudian discovery meant no less than that man's modes of knowing and loving arise out of a preconceptual pre-rational and pre-verbal world, a world inhabited by mother and child together, unquote. I say he's being way too generous to Freud because that is psychoanalysis as Stern reads it. Um, that man's modes of knowing and loving arise out of this pre-conceptual, pre-rational world inhabited by mother and child together. That's not Freud. That's Stern. I mean, Freud was constantly, you know, in, you, you read Future of an Illusion, or civilization is discontents, and he's talking about the child's need for the protection of a protective, and you expect him to say mother, and he always says father. <laughs> uh, so, but Stern gets this. Even when we justifiably replace the term mother with that of primary carer, who might well be a nurturant male, it remains a world as yet free of that ghastly fissure, Stern's terms, ghastly fissure between subject and object, self and other. Granted, this primary union must be surrendered. Primary mother-infant symbiosis must be surrendered so that the higher union, represented by mature, self-dispossessing love, may be developed. But surely, if we are to have any hope of healing our destructive alienation from our environment, ourselves, and one another, we must retain some echo of that, quote, sensation of eternity. I'm quoting now from Freud's chapter one of Civilization and its Discontents, when he's responding to Romain Roland, who says to Freud, your earlier book, Future of Illusion, which reveals religion to be a crutch, a wishful illusion embraced by people who want to believe there's a big daddy running the show and that the bad will be punished and the good will be rewarded and it's so childish I can hardly describe it. Freud's embarrassed for humanity when he describes this, this, this patently infantile illusion. R Roland writes, you got it right, that's what a great deal of popular religion is. 
But you've missed the real essence of healthy religion, which is in the sensation of eternity, a feeling as of something limitless, unbounded, as it were, oceanic. That feeling of an indissoluble bond, of being one with the external world as a whole, which Freud confessed to Romain Roland that he had never personally experienced, and that he then proceeded to devalue as infantile in favor of the experience of the ego as autonomous and unitary, marked off distinctly from everything else, unquote. He says some mystics are not necessarily psychotic. They're able to become psychotic in one sector of their minds while remaining attached to reality in other sectors. But their mystical vision is psychotic, even though they may not be psychotic in a fully clinical sense, because they've lost the boundary between self and other. Because Freud is defining mental health as having developed an ego that is autonomous and unitary, marked off distinctly from everything else. Although mystics of all traditions have always known this ego, this autonomous ego, is illusory, today, in light of such phenomena as the butterfly effect, such knowledge is scientific. The all is one experience is what science reveals to be the truth. The butterfly flaps its wings in the Amazon and it affects the weather in Toronto. Everything is connected. As His Holiness Pope Francis writes in Laudato Si, quote, it cannot be emphasized enough how everything is interconnected. Time and space are not independent of one another, and not even atoms or subatomic particles can be considered in isolation, unquote. Whatever else the illusory autonomous ego has made possible for us, we are rapidly becoming aware of how it is contributing to anthropogenic climate disruption and quite possibly to the sixth extinction. Last paragraph. Freud regarded enhanced reality testing as a central goal of psychoanalytic therapy. Stern endorses this goal, but goes well beyond Freud's understanding of what it entails. For Stern, quotes, our development aims toward a state in which there exists not only a clear demarcation between self and non-self, but wherefore the non-self, that is the object to be experienced in its full reality, for the non-self, for the object to be experienced in its full reality, for what it really is, the self has to do a kind of disappearing act, unquote. In this connection, Stern cites a passage by Emil Choran, quoted by Gabriel Marcel, quotes, so-called civilization teaches us how to take possession of things when it should initiate us in the art of letting go. For there is neither freedom nor real life without an apprenticeship in depossession, unquote. I think Stern would agree that the self that needs to disappear, that we need to let go of, is the idol that Jacques Lacan called the specular ego or self-image, and that Donald Winnicott saw as the false self that usurps the rightful place of the essentially unknowable, yet realizable, true self, the I-subject who can only be in the presence of a non-intruding non-abandoning, that is loving, non-intruding, non non-abandoning, non abandoning, that is loving thou. In making an it of everyone and everything, through processes of objectification and commodification, in inflaming our narcissism to a pathological degree, our consumer capitalist culture of narcissism far from assisting us in the, ta in the task of self-dispossession, may well result in our depossession of a world, a world that was given to us as a gift, but of which we have pre proved to be poor caretakers. All this, for me at least, gives new meaning to the Genesis account of our expulsion from the garden, an account we have always taken as a story of the beginning rather than 
of what increasingly appears may be the beginning of the end. We must weep for what we have lost and are losing. Thank you very much. Um, should we take a five minute break before we move on to the new? Yeah. Okay. Yes. Five minute break. So let me uh, begin by thanking Dr. Carbeth for his outstanding paper, which does an excellent job of articulating Carl Stern's analysis of some of our cultural pathologies and underlining the value of that analysis. For my part, I would like in the next few minutes to comment on just two separate points derived from uh, Stern's work and from Carbeth's paper. First, I would like to discuss uh, Stern's critique of positivism, highlighting both its unique nature, its nature and uniqueness, as well as underlining a parallel between it and certain styles of social critique in ancient philosophy. Second, I want to discuss an issue Carbeth brings up in his own name, namely the problem of conscience in psychoanalysis. So I will talk about St. Thomas, actually. Oh, good. So concerning positivism, critiques of positivism abound in the early and mid-20th centuries, especially amongst philosophers of the continental variety. But though such critiques are not uncommon, their focus is often and perhaps usually on theoretical problems associated with positivism, and in particular, certain theoretical contradictions, which positivism seems to imply. For example, a central epistemological tenet of cruder forms of positivism is that all valid knowledge must be empirically verifiable. And that proposition itself, as many philosophers have pointed out, cannot be empirically verified, <laughs> in part because it's not an empirical generalization in the first place, uh, but something like an a priori statement about the nature of knowledge. Thus, so the critique goes, one of the principles of positivism seems to contradict itself, suggesting a basic piece of irrationality at the very roots of positivism. You find critiques of this in many uh, thinkers, uh, the great founder of phenomenology, Edmund Husserl, uh, being a good example. Husserl uses essentially this critique against all attempts at an exclusively empirical foundation for logic, and thus for scientific methods in general in his first major work on logical investigations. Stern's criticism of positivism, however, is not like that of Husserl or more generally, like the epistemologically oriented critiques that are most common. Because uh, Stern's criticism does not focus on positivism's theoretical problems at all. Certainly Stern accepts such criticisms. He, in fact, assumes criticism of a more properly epistemological type in many of the comments he makes against positivistic theories, especially in the Third Revolution. Furthermore, one could certainly say that Stern seeks to highlight irrationality in positivism, though it is a less theoretical than a psychological irrationality he focuses on. But Stern neither appears satisfied with purely epistemological critiques, nor does he take his own criticism primarily in that direction. Rather, as Carbeth emphasizes, Stern takes the different route of associating positivism with a specific cultural pathology. In other words, though positivism does indeed express irrationality of various sorts, including when it functions not as a limited scientific theory, but as a general worldview, its greater danger lies in what it does to human beings who adhere to it. As Stern writes in the Third Revolution, quote, is it possible that we in this country are entering the age of Comte, to be the age of positivism, without realizing it? In the pages that follow, a lot will be said to justify such an apprehension. Although outward appearances are much less dramatic, the dehumanizing and destructive force inherent in the development uh, are no less formidable than they are in the case of the other two revolutions, in this development, I'm sorry, are no less formidable than they were in the case of the two other, other two revolutions which arose out of the 19th century, the Marxist and the racist ones. This is an important comparison, but as far as moral nihilism is concerned, the Third Revolution has full potentialities of matching the other two, unquote. But even as a critique, as a critic of positivism, Stern remains a psychoanalyst, focusing less on finer logical and philosophical points of theory, and more on what a movement like positive, positivism tells us about the, quote, dehumanizing and destructive forces, unquote pressuring the psyche of a culture, which not only proffers such thinking, but even more finds such thinking convincing. In this respect, Stern comes at the end, one might say, of a line of thinkers in the German-speaking world, originating perhaps with Friedrich Schelling, who believe that a society can be evaluated in terms of health or illness, and whose pathologies, though affecting individual members of that society, are not reducible to the sum of those individuals. Rather, it is the ethos of the culture or society itself, which is pathological. 
Though I trace Stern's thinking to the German uh, philosophical tradition of the early 19th century, I don't mean to suggest that German philosophers originate the idea that societies could be healthy or pathological, or that they could be analyzed as such. Quite the contrary, one can trace this approach at least as far back as Plato, who in his Republic has Socrates purporting to analyze, the health, uh, analyze healthy and ill societies, or cities, but in such a way that the analyses can also be used analogically to analyze the human psyche. The city, the character of Socrates tells us in the Republic, is the soul written in large letters. Hence, to analyze the city is to analyze the soul and vice versa. While such an approach might not conform to contemporary standards of social science, it is a common way of approaching society from traditional philosophical viewpoints. Political philosopher Eric Boblin suggests that to understand this approach, we have to articulate the forms of what he calls existential truth, meaning not the truth of propositions, but truth in the sense of living or existing authentically in society. On Boblin's account, then, Plato understands politics in terms of a particular form of existential truth, what Boblin calls the anthropological type, whereby Plato conceives of the health of illness of a society in terms of the sort and quality of the person that that society, society produces. With this style of social analysis, then, the dominant forms of personality in a given society and especially the dominant forms of cultural and political leadership it produces, act as the best indicators of the relative health of disease in the society. If a society produces leaders, say, of the caliber of Washington, Adams, and Jefferson, people of superior abilities for their time, whatever we might think of their specific life decisions, it's probably a society that's a good deal healthier than a society that produces a preponderance of men like, I don't know, Donald Trump comes to mind. <laughs> <laughs> this correspondence or correlation between the nature of society and the kind of individual it produces is a chief reason why, for Plato, the society or city is the sole written large. The style of analysis was, in fact, fairly common in the ancient world. The diagnosis and nosos, or disease of the soul in society, was almost taken for granted once Plato initiated the approach. Aristotle uses an analogous form of analysis in politics. And the Roman philosopher Cicero continues it centuries later. Cicero, in fact, has a quite striking analysis of a disease of the soul, which can, in principle, infect the entire society in his Tusculan disputations, a psychopathology he calls astronautio rationis, a contempt for reason. Cicero also notes that the condition has definite definable symptoms, among which Cicero mentions restless money making, status seeking, womanizing, overeating. Addiction to delicacies and snacks. <laughs> Wait, where's wine tippling? <laughs> Cicero and Tuscan temptations. His desire for fame, uh, and many others. Such a list might lead one to the erroneous conclusion that Cicero also had access to People magazine. Uh, though, uh, no copies from that time were extant. <laughs> Um, yet, however contemporary that list might appear, it may indicate a relative consistency, either in human nature or at least a relative consistency between Roman and contemporary American spiritual pathologies. I've entered into some discussion of this ancient style of social analysis because we see virtually the same type of analysis reenacted in Stern's work. Naturally, given the psychoanalytic trajectory of his approach, Stern does not use the philosophical forms of di diagnosis that the ancient philosophers did. But though the terms of the analysis are therefore different, the method is strikingly similar. Harbeth, for example, mentions the opening section of Stern's Flight from Woman, where Stern describes a certain type of person in the following manner, quote, the man of restless energy, the hustler, the go-getter, is a figure familiar to the popular imagination. One associates this kind of life with organization men, managerial and executive types, unquote. That Stern considers such a person a kind of cultural dominant is clear. In fact, he considers this kind of person not only quantitatively dominant, in that there are many such people, but also qualitatively dominant, in that the image of such a person breaks the popular imagination. Stern then diagnoses this type of person precisely to highlight that the dominance of such people in a society is a problem for the society. That is, this type of person, one lacking, quote, balance between action and contemplation, unquote, is suffering from pathology. And then using psychoanalytic theory, Stern posits the likely source of such pathology what he terms a flight from woman, by which he means, by which he seems to be the devaluation of the virtues and practices our tradition tends to associate with the feminine, and in particular with the maternal. Stern's analysis, therefore, in most respects, conforms to that ancient practice of social analysis in terms of what Bowman called anthropological truth, 
by tracing dominant though pathological forms of pathology to social relationships endemic to the society, in this case, the lack of maternal care. Positivism, too, on Stern's account, is a disease of the cultural soul, as Harbeth stresses it as the opening uh, quotation of Laudatio Si also emphasizes. A method used in science is one thing, but it's becoming the very form of perception is quite another. To do science, one does have to take a certain approach to reality, one which includes viewing reality primarily as a set of objective qualities that one can measure. Concluding from this latter practice, however, that reality consists solely in such objective measurable qualities is a very different point, and different not only theoretically, but for the cultural psyche. Part of the point Stern, every psychoanalyst seems to be making, is that science is not only knowledge, but is also a body of habits and stances of the psyche toward the world. Habits and stances which become pathological precisely by becoming the basic way in which a given society approaches the world. It's being toward the world, as Maurice Maritonti might put it, rather than simply an exercise of a specific mental technique characteristic of the practice of science. Stern's analysis assumes something like a mechanism of the mind, whereby original insights can lose their meaning through misplaced generalizations and through the failure on the part of a person or community to continually revisit one's knowledge claims on the basis of ongoing experience. Max Scheler would term this tendency the functionalization of knowledge, whereby, according to Scheler, the mind tends to accept its original experience of an insight as a way to conserve the energy, rather than continually returning to the insight to clarify it, purify it, test it against newly attained knowledge, and so forth. When knowledge is functionalized in this fashion, whether in an individual or in a society, it can run amok, seeming evident to the person or society who holds it, but has actually lost its original meaning, and though the current understanding of the point could not really stand up to the test of critical reason. Much of the dogmatism and uncritical acceptance of often, of often absurd ideas we see around us is rooted, according to Shaler, in this tendency toward functionalization. Stern seems to see something similar to positivism. Within its own proper limited sphere, as an approach to certain sciences, positivism contains genuine insight. But as a generalized worldview, it can be disastrous and quite damaging to the cultural psyche. Harbeth quoted Stern's comment, quote, the reason uh, most of us hesitate to apply the word knowledge to insight within the aesthetic continuum and want to, uh, to reserve it strictly for scientific knowledge is that our minds have become so warped by the positivist bias that we cannot think straight anymore. Stern evidently believes that positivism is pathological enough that it warps the mind, even to the point of missing elements of reality. Shaler might say that positivism has become so rigidly functionalized in our culture that one can hardly distinguish the claims of positivism from reality itself, let alone take a healthy critical stance toward those claims. Stern's response to that situation is profoundly psychoanalytic. It is, as we have seen, to move away from theoretical problems associated with positivist theory and toward the characterization of the psychopathologies positivistic societal attitudes produce. Presumably, Stern does this in the hopes that someone, at least relatively free of that pathology, will reflect on it sufficiently actually to see its pathological character. For the man of action in flight from women, the foundational pathological social relationships pertain to lack of maternal holding. For the positivist in the third revolution that comes from an objectifying stance toward the world, one which forbids the empathy and that oneness we should feel with our fellow human beings, let alone with the rest of the cosmos. Evidently, Stern's hope is that diagnosing the disease and its foundation and disordered social relationships will inspire the society to re-examine those relationships. In this respect, Stern's approach once again echoes the aims of Plato and many ancient philosophers, who sought in such diagnosis and analysis a way to free their own societies from such diseases. If Stern's analysis has at least one advantage to that of the ancient philosophers, clinical experience can, as a rule, attain to a richer insight into the pathology of the soul of philosophy. Moving away from epistemology and pathology, I note that Carveth raises an interesting question in his paper concerning whether or not one needs to add a fourth psychic function to the standard three functions of Freudian structural theory. That is, should we add conscience to ego, superego, and id? Now, admittedly, since I'm a Jungian, I probably have some un unconscious predilections for quaternities, <laughs> something you <laughs> develops over and over again in some chemical studies. I was aware of that when I used the word. <laughs> <That's right. laughs> <laughs> but setting aside my Jungian proclivities, I couldn't agree more uh, with Carveth that those of us who are eminent practitioners need to have something along the lines of conscience and understand it as something different from the superego, 
whereby we can aid our patients in differentiating between authentic and inauthentic moral cognition. That being said, I'm struck by the manner in which Kardath poses the issue of conscience, particularly the way he brings up the traditional is ought problem. The is ought problem is, of course, centuries old and has had a lot of ink spilled over it. Uh, one could give a rough formulation of the problem by saying it is the question of whether, and if so, how one can derive propositions of the ought variety, such as moral, ethical, or aesthetic propositions, which prescribe what should be, from propositions of the is variety, that is, propositions which are primarily descriptive of what is or is not the case. And the old trope, which uh, Carveth has invoked here, is that one cannot derive an ought from it is, and correlatively, that conscience cannot be a function of reason, because one cannot derive ought, the subject matter of conscience, from it is, the subject matter of reason. Now, in principle, I think one can grant Carveth's point, providing we assume a distinctly modern notion of reason by which I mean more precisely the notion of reason more or less engendered by British empiricism in the scientific revolution. However, it seems to me far from established that that modern notion of reason is the only genuine or only viable notion of reason, especially for understanding either conscience or psychoanalysis. Carveth notes that Thomas Aquinas, for example, would disagree with him about conscience because Aquinas believes conscience is rooted in reason. That point is certainly true as far as it goes. However, we miss some of the nuance of the situation if we leave it there. St. Thomas, and with him most pre-empiricist philosophers, would also hold that reason itself means something significantly different from what it has meant since the advent of British empiricism. In other words, the notion of reason has a history. Reason has, has not meant the same thing throughout the history of Western thought. And with that difference, the proposition that conscience is or is not rooted in reason must change accordingly. While there might be, in fact, many differences between pre- and post-empiricist notions of reason, one central difference between them is that pre-empiricist thinkers assume reason has a teleology, that is, a kind of purposefulness written into its nature, a belief that is in sharp contrast to the conceptions of reason after empiricism in the scientific revolution. Referring back to Shaler's idea of functionalization, we might say that the very form of the experience of reason in the post-empiricist era has become non-teleological, precisely because the practices of reason after the scientific revolution included rejecting the validity of all forms of teleology and final causality, which were more or less impossible to measure by scientific methods, and which in any case suggested an ultimate meaning to the world about which natural science has very little to say. But in the pre-scientific Western world, rationality was exercised with a teleological orientation, both in the sense that reason itself was understood to be teleological, and that the empirical world to which one applied reason was also conceived. Thus, presumably, teleology was experienced as something intrinsic to reason in the pre modern era. I highlight the experiential point because in such a pre scientific world, one wouldn't have to infer from the to an art. This teleology would be experienced as something intrinsic to the empirical factual nature of things. No inference would be necessary. In fact, this is why Cicero, in the passages referred to above, could understand psychopathology in terms of contempt for reason. If he only meant a contempt for a logic or scientific method, though that might have some pathological elements and would hardly produce disorder or disturbance in the soul all by itself, a contempt for reason would only actually disturb the soul if reason were intrinsically teleological but being used in an anti-teleological way, which is just what Cicero's point is. My point here, then, is that the proposition that one cannot infer an from it is might seem like a trait of straightforward truism, but it might also seem that way, not because reason isn't teleological, but because the functionalized way modern rational practice rejects teleology has made that presupposition seem obvious. Indeed, this point is significant for more than historical reasons. While I understand one might read Freud and psychoanalytic theory in more than one way, it seems to me that there is a kind of teleology in the psyche, an orientation or purposefulness that we analytically oriented therapists take for granted. Certainly, in the Jungian tradition from which I come, we hold that there's a teleological push in the psyche, an orientation with a definite ethical and normative meaning. Jung calls the telos of this push individuation, the becoming whole, unified, less divided from oneself. While psychoanalytic theory might not have quite so robust a sense of teleology as Jung had, it still seems to me that psychoanalytic practice does assume such a teleology, and that the success of analytic therapy includes the fact that insight and the relief of symptoms helps bring, about, bring that teleological push back into order. And there are, of course, standard readings of psychoanalytic theory that suggest a strong parallel with Jung's insistence on teleology, such that the dynamic in psychodynamic refers precisely to an innate teleology of the psyche. 
So if my point about teleology of the psyche is more or less on target, there is a twofold irony in Carvet's characterization of conscience and his thought problem. The first irony is that, in spite of his approval of Stern's rejection of positivist pathologies, Carvet himself draws some of his theoretical principles of conscience from what we may call the proto-positivism of the empiricist tradition. The rejection of a connection between is and odd is characteristic precisely of positivism, and yes. indeed of a positivist conception of reality. And naturally, the fact that it is positivist does not make it false. But if we are going to question elements of the positivist pathology in our age, its ethical consequences, I would think, would be one of the first things we want to question. The second irony is that, at least as I read it, analytic traditions of both the Korean and the Indian variety seem, if anything, to have recovered the ancient view of the teleology of the soul, rather than having abandoned it. If that is the case, it seems to me that any analytically valuable articulation of conscience might want to begin uh, not with the rejection of the link between is and ought, but would rather want to begin with the teleology of the psyche as one of the cornerstones of its theory, since that teleology would suggest that normativity of some kind is embedded in psychic reality, a normativity that might actually be the basis of our intuitive understanding of ethics in the first place. Thank you.